The first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Move the humanity! The fires of frustration and discord are burning in Let us city. not forget for a moment the toils and efforts that lie ahead. They say that those who forget their history are condemned to repeat it. This is the History Lessons Podcast with certified financial planning practitioner Patrick Huey, author of History Lessons for the Modern Investor and your guide to financial wisdom in the past, present, and future. You ready? Good. Let's get historical. Historical? Yeah, if you say so. And this is the History Lessons Podcast for the week of 17 June 2024. And I'm Patrick Huey, author of History Lessons for the Modern Investor. And if you're a modern investor seeking some historical perspective right now, at least more than you're getting on X, formerly known as Twitter, well, you're in the right place. This week, we'll be talking about toasting Geminis, humble beginnings, and restricted stock. But first, the well, news. This week is my birthday. And if you follow these things, and I'm certainly not saying that you should, you'll know that my astrological sign is Gemini. Gemini is the third astrological sign in the Zodiac, usually represented by the twins Castor and Pollux. But I'm not the only one out there with a twin personality these days. It seems like every bit of data economically that gets released has a happy side and a more, shall we say, moody one. Let's start with the consumer price index. Didn't change in May, which is a good sign, as it indicates that inflation is lower than expected for the second month in a row. Hooray! The peasants rejoice. Well, the decrease in inflation was mainly due to a 2% drop in energy prices. Wonder how long that'll stick around. Especially gasoline, uh, which fell by 3.6%. When excluding energy and food, core prices increased by 0.2% and have risen by 3.4% over the past year. The problem is still the housing sector, which continues to surprise, defying predictions that it would decline as interest rates rose. Let's move on to the producer price index, the PPI. It went down by 0.2% in May, marking the fastest decline in over six months. Again, cue the peasants. However, this decrease followed a significant increase in April, and the data has been quite variable, quite choppy lately. Over the year's first five months, producer prices have seen three monthly readings at 0.4% or higher, and two outright declines. Hmm. Producer prices have risen by 2.2% over the past 12 months, matching the highest reading in more than a year. This uncertain environment presents a challenge for our friends at the Federal Reserve, and is leading to a downgrade in rate cut expect expectations amongst Fed watchers, of whom I unfortunately now count myself. Following last week's meeting, the Fed clarified its stance, indicating that fewer rate cuts are expected in 2024, because duh, probably only one or two now with a start more likely after the election than before. However, the Fed's explanation of the logic behind the future direction of policy left something to be desired. Their forecast for year-end readings on core inflation and unemployment rate show no change from current readings. So basically, nothing will change and rates will go down. Apparently, the more things change, the more they will stay the same, which is actually not a bad birthday toast for this Gemini. Interest rates are rising. And your annuity, purchased in the last decade, might not be keeping up, which means your financial plan may be falling behind. So if you own a deferred annuity, fixed, indexed, or variable worth more than $250,000, now is the time to review it and make sure it is doing all that it can for you and your financial plan. Let us help you keep your retirement on track. Introducing Victory Independent Planning. VIP turns complex financial matters into clear and confident solutions so you can relax and enjoy retirement whenever it arrives. Get the annuity review kit now. This complimentary kit includes a variety of checklists, resources, and ebooks to review the fees, features, and flexibility, or lack thereof, in your current annuity contract. 
It will even help you assess your overall investment goals and the people who are offering you advice. Get the kit today, because you can't teach an old annuity new tricks. To learn how VIP can help you review your annuity, click on the link in the show notes or go to victoryindependentplanning.com. That's victoryindependentplanning.com. Sign up for peace of mind today. Alexa, charge that Wayback Machine and set it for 1810 AD. Charging Wayback Machine. On June 23rd, 1810, the German immigrant John Jacob Astor forms the Pacific American Fur Company in New York City. John Jacob was born in Waldorf, Germany in 1763, and at the age of 21, immigrated to the United States in 1784, where he began his career selling, of all things, musical instruments that he imported from London. He soon shifted to the fur trade, leveraging his connections and business acumen to dominate that industry. Astor's American Fur Company became the leading player in furs, establishing trading posts across North America. And as the market waned, he wisely diversified into things like real estate, acquiring vast tracts of land in what would become prime areas of New York City. His investments in real estate paid off rather handsomely as the city grew, making him the first multimillionaire in the United States. He left a lasting legacy through his philanthropic efforts, including the establishment of the Astor Library, which contributed to the foundation of the New York Public Library. Astor's life journey from a poor immigrant to a wealthy and influential businessman is, I think, a quintessential tale of American success. Okay, now Astor's journey from humble beginnings to becoming one of the richest men of his time offers a few enduring investment lessons. Here are some key takeaways from his life. Number one, have a clear goal, but also be adaptable. Markets change, and the ability to pivot is crucial for long-term success. Astor's initial success came from musical instruments and then the fur trade. And fur was a booming industry in the late 18th and 19th centuries, early 19th centuries. But he recognized the potential early on and realized when that potential was waning and adapted his strategies as the market evolved. That willingness to pivot from pianos and flutes to furs and later to real estate demonstrates the importance of having a clear vision but remaining flexible and adaptable to new opportunities. Number two, diversify your investments to manage risk. Astor didn't rely on a single industry for his wealth. And after establishing himself in furs, he did that diversification thing. This diversification helped him mitigate risks and capitalize on the burgeoning city's growth. Number three, think long-term. Patience and strategic planning are vital. Astor's real estate investments were made with the long term in mind as he purchased land in what was the outskirts of New York City, a city of about 25,000 people at the time of the revolution. But obviously, he knew something was going on there and anticipated the city's expansion. And this foresight allowed him to reap enormous profits as the city grew. Number four, identify and leverage your competitive advantages. In the fur trade, Astor leveraged his relationships and his knowledge of the American interior, where he traveled frequently to to secure exclusive deals with Native American tribes and in European markets, where he also went back repeatedly. His ability to navigate complex trade networks gave him that competitive advantage. So as a modern investor, what's your competitive advantage? Well, as a small investor, it's that you don't have to report quarterly to a board overseeing your every move. Unlike the professionals, this should make you less short-term focused. And that, friends, is a good thing. Number five, take calculated risks, but manage them wisely. Understand that the potential downsides are there and have strategies in place to mitigate them. Astor certainly did. For instance, his venture into the fur trade involved significant risks due to its dependence on volatile factors like fashion trends and political relations. Yeah, you think those might be slightly volatile? However, he mitigated these risks by establishing his vast network, and again, he remained nimble. Number six, reinvest your profits to compound growth when you can. Reinvesting your earnings can accelerate the wealth accumulation and create a self-sustaining cycle of growth. Astor continually reinvested his profits back into his ventures. Profits from the fur trade 
were funneled into real estate, which then provided even greater returns. Seventh and finally, plan for the future beyond your lifetime. Effective estate planning can preserve and grow your wealth for future generations and contribute to lasting legacies. John Jacob Astor was mindful of that, establishing the Astor Library, which later became part of the New York Public Library, and his careful estate planning ensured that his wealth continued to benefit future generations. John Jacob's life is a testament, I think, to the power of vision, adaptability, diversification, long-term planning, and building and sustaining your wealth. His strategies and principles are timeless, and the modern investor can learn a little something from the nation's first millionaire. Wayback Machine disengaged. Returning to the year 2024. Finally this week, it's on to the mailbag. You've got mail. This week's question was, what do I need to know about the restricted stock that was granted to me by my employer? Good question. And remember, if you're listening to this podcast and want to see the visuals referenced during this segment, please join us on Substack where you can view video versions of this podcast or on YouTube where you can do the same. Now, I have a client, we're going to call him Mike, who came to me recently with a variety of stock incentive plans that his employer offers. And he wanted to make sense of the risks he was taking and the tax consequences of any other strategy other than holding on to them and waiting. So let's take a look today at the basics of one type of incentive that he got. In future weeks, we'll look at some others. And those are restricted stock units. Okay, first step. You must, once you are granted any type of employer benefit, read the offering document from your employer. I got his and we reviewed it together. And understanding the topics involved in the key stock plan documents will help you make the most of any restricted stock or restricted stock unit grants. We'll talk about the differences there and prevent costly potential mistakes. Let's start off with 10 questions to consider with RSUs, restricted stock units. And then I'll get back to my story uh, about Mike. So number one, first question to ask yourself is, do I have uh, a grant of restricted stock or do I have a grant of restricted stock units? Well, what's the difference? Restricted stock is granted and at the time of issue, it is then held in escrow. You have voting rights, you uh, pay Social Security and Medicare tax at vesting, and you pay income tax at vesting. Uh, you have no deferral available, but you do get the right to dividends on those stocks. Whereas with RSUs, you uh, receive vesting on a schedule, typically. Uh, you don't have voting rights until you actually have exercised. Um, your Social Security and Medicare taxes are paid again at vesting. Your income tax is paid at share delivery. And you have the potential to defer uh, some of those taxes, maybe if correctly elected. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. And you don't have rights to dividends. However, some companies may provide dividend equivalents if they are so inclined. We'll cover that as well in a second. Okay, so first question, what do I have? Second question, is formal acceptance of this grant required? What happens if I don't accept the grant before it vests? Well, again, you need to go back and check your grant agreement form that the company uses to grant you any type of equity awards. Grant agreements can be in the form of printed certificates or letters or these days online documents. Alert. Think about this. You may need to formally accept the grant with a printed or an online signature. And if you don't, you may forfeit that grant, essentially leaving money on the table. Don't be that person. Okay, third question. What is the vesting schedule? So a vesting schedule is a time-based, either a graded or cliff vesting, uh, meaning either you work for three to five years and everything gets vested at once, or you get a portion that vests over that three to five year period. 
First one's a cliff, second one is graded. Number four, is vesting based on the duration of employment from the grant date or is it on performance goals? So even after the shares are paid out for meeting the pre-established performance goals, the shares can then include some time vesting rules as well that require continued employment. So you might have a common performance target and these are market oriented or company oriented based on internal corporate goals relative to competitors. So like total share return or earnings per share, sales, return on assets, return on equity, yada, 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 uh, could be the performance trigger in these grants. So know what you have and know what you have to do in order to get it. Number five, what would happen to the vesting of my grant if I were to leave, lose my job, die, become disabled, retire, or become retirement eligible? So basically, know what's going to happen to your grants if you're not around uh, when it's time to exercise or, or you're not part of the company when it's time to do that. Um, what I'll tell you is that about 97% of companies um, are going to um, terminate your awards when you're terminated for cause. About uh, two thirds will terminate uh, if you are terminated involuntarily. Uh, if you resign, it's about 95%. If you die, about 60%. If you're disabled, it's about 52%. And if you retire, it's about 32% of companies uh, that will actually continue to uh, offer participation to you. Question six, when the shares vest, what account will they appear in? Hmm. Well, before the vesting date, when the restriction lapses and the shares are released, you'll have to open an account with the brokerage firm or transfer agent that your company designates. Make sure you do that. If you have any uh, equity compensation at all and you plan on participating, get on it, make sure the account is there. You don't wanna be scrambling at the last minute to have an account to receive these shares. Number seven, does the company offer a choice for the tax withholding or does it hold back shares to pay the taxes? So taxes on this compensation income are withheld at vesting and they either are going to require cash at vesting or they'll sell stock to cover. So know which one is gonna happen and make sure that you understand the taxation that is involved. It's gonna be federal income tax Typically, this is taxed at a flat 22%, unless your company uses uh, the supplemental rate, which is uh, 37% for folks with over a million dollars in compensation. Um, there's also going to be Social Security and Medicare taxes and potentially state and local when applicable. So know what to, you are in for uh, when the tax man visits you uh, after exercise. Number eight, with RSUs, can I defer the delivery of the shares at vesting? Well, the ability to defer the delivery of RSU shares and thus the ordinary income taxes at vesting depends on whether your company has a provision for this in its stock plan. Okay, so deferral is not permitted with standard restricted stock grants. If you just get restricted stock, you're paying the tax. Uh, but you may be able to defer if you're getting RSUs and if your company has set it up correctly. Number nine, if my company pays dividends to shareholders, will I get dividends on my restricted stock? If so, when? And what if I have a grant of an RSU instead? Well, usually restricted stock grants give you the same dividend. We talked about the, that at the beginning. You have dividend voting and other rights, just like any other shareholder in your company's common stock. Shares of restricted stock are issued to you and are outstanding in your name from the time of grant, though typically you can't transfer them until the vesting date. That's that escrow period. At 74% of the company's employees are eligible to receive uh, dividend equivalents in RSUs though. Okay, so the company is gonna create some cash type benefit to add to your shares uh, on top of the potential price appreciation in order to make up for the fact that in the RSU, you're not getting that dividend like a normal shareholder would. Okay, 10th, what would happen to my restricted stock in a corporate acquisition or a merger? 
Well, the treatment of the restricted stock or restricted stock units in the acquisition or merger is going to depend on the deal terms and on what is allowed or limited under your stock plan and grant agreement. agreement. So it's probably going to require some reading. Look for the details in the finalized M&A agreement and your company's communication materials and good luck because they're going to be lengthy. Okay, let's go in and take a look at uh, a checklist that I went through with my client, Mike. Okay, when we went in and looked, um, do we need to review how the RSUs work? Yeah, we did. We needed to go back into the documents. Uh, we knew the ge general basics, of course, but the, the devil's in the details and the details were incorporated into that employer's uh, grant term document. So do we need to confirm the conditions of vesting? Well, it was graduated vesting. We knew that. And the vesting trigger should be closely monitored. Uh, we knew that as well. We are actually tracking uh, all of his RSUs as well as other stock options, which we'll talk about later in another episode. Does your plan allow you to defer distribution of shares? His did not. Do you need to review what you will receive when your RSUs vest? Yep, we were uh, stock settlement. We knew that they were going to sell stock to cover the taxes and they were going to withhold 22% plus state tax. Uh, does the company accrue or pay dividend equivalents? In his case, they do not. Do you need to review how termination of your employment uh, would affect this? You know, we weren't too worried about that. He's uh, he's fairly young and fairly uh, established at this company. So that wasn't something we needed to worry about just at this moment. Uh, investment issues. This is where we really focused on with him. Do shares of your company's stock, along with any unvested RSUs, make up a significant portion of your investment portfolio? Yes, was the answer. Uh, and the issue here was that he's getting or participating in a stock uh, fund inside of his 401k that owns company stock as well. And right now, that's a little bit over 10% of his total portfolio. So that's a little bit more risk than we want to take every time these RSUs become available. So in his case, uh, what we decided to do, there are no blackout, or there are company restrictions, blackout windows, but once we're outside of those, uh, we wanted to uh, basically engage in exercise and sell of these RSUs so that we can diversify them and not continue to add to the about 10% that he's already got in company stock. If we weren't able to do that for whatever reason, or we didn't want to, and we started to carry more than 10% in company stock, well, that's a time when we would look at downside protection. Do you need downside protection while you're holding your company shares? Uh, we could buy put options. Broad market could work, or we could buy put options against the particular stock, depending on how liquid it is. And obviously, it's got to be a public company in order to do that. All right, moving on to tax issues. Do you need to understand the tax consequences of the grant of your ROSUs? If anybody checks no on that, uh, I would be super suspicious. Um, you do need to understand the tax implications and the tax consequences of the grant and the vesting, okay? And ultimately the sale of those shares as well. Do you wanna reduce your income tax liability? No, I don't. Well, of course you do but you actually may not be able to. If you're already maxing out your 457, 401k, that type of thing, uh, and you're already bunching, you, the tax situation may just be the tax situation. And that's actually the case uh, in, in Mike's situation as well. Do you need to plan for tax withholding in the year of, of vesting? Well, yeah, of course you do. Once you get through the tax planning piece and you know that you're gonna have a, uh, a tax liability, well, then we need to make sure you have the cash available uh, or that you're withholding elsewhere in order to make up for any lack of withholding uh, once the grant is made and exercised. Uh, does your company offer the IRC 83I election to defer the recognition of income for up to five years after your RSUs vest? This could be something that is written into your company's plan. It wasn't in this case, uh, but if you're out there listening, take a look and know if you can defer. Reasons to defer? Well, if you're gonna have a lower income year potentially within those five years, you might be able to save yourself some taxes. Otherwise, it probably doesn't make sense to do it. 
Do you need help determining your cost basis in any shares acquired at vesting? He did not. Do you need help determining your holding period for shares acquired through your RSC plan? Again, he didn't because we've been tracking this uh, through our internal software. Do you need help understanding the tax consequences of the sale of shares acquired through your RSC plan? Yes, absolutely. And that is part of the overall tax planning piece. Okay, we, we have to really take a step back here and say, not only is this all part of a retirement plan and a retirement income plan, but that moves into a, an investment plan and a tax plan. And if all those things are working together, you know, it makes the management of restricted stock and RSUs a heck of a lot easier because you're dealing with data and not, you know, taking shots at a dartboard in the dark. Some miscellaneous issues to keep in mind. Uh, assess your employer's future equity value and long-term viability. In Mike's case, he works for a Fortune 500 company. We weren't super you know, concerned about uh, the viability or his uh, term at the, at the company. Is there a risk that your company will be acquired in the future? In his case, no. That may be different for some people. So know what you're getting into and know what the provisions are if you are required. Acquired, excuse me. Do you have future financial goals that your RSUs or shares could help to achieve? In his case, absolutely, yes. It's all about retirement. And we needed to add that to the pot and the overall portfolio and get it diversified uh, and under a uh, managed investment plan. Need to address your RSUs in your estate plan or in a divorce? No. Uh, does your uh, a plan allow you to designate a beneficiary? In his case, uh, it did not, but something to think about. And do you need to consider any state-specific issues? Yeah, he did. He's in a high-tax state, and it's something we needed to be aware of. So my fellow historians, that is all for this week. Be sure to check out my book. That's History Lessons for the Modern Investor, and it's available on Amazon.com. And be sure to do all the social stuff like this episode. Follow us wherever you see or hear your podcast. Give us a five star. Let me know that you did it. And I'll send you a complimentary copy of History Lessons for the Modern Investor. Remember, we're available on Substack, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Until next week. We'll take another rocking romp through the past and make an investment in your future with history lessons for the modern investor. See you next week. <laughs>